This is Sigma's new 24 to 70 f2.8 for Sony E-mount. I've been testing it all week, and today I'm gonna to show you how it compares to the G Master from Sony and the 28 to 75 from Tamron. Let's get undone. Gerald Undone, he's crazy. What's happening everybody? I'm Gerald Undone, and my E-mount brings all the boys to the yard. So I've actually got two of these Sigma 24 to 70s because I noticed a strange behavior in the first model I was testing and so I asked for a second unit to compare and we'll get into that strange behavior in a second. If you follow me on Instagram or Twitter, you might have already seen what I'm referring to, but the reason why I'm mentioning this now is to let you know that camera number two has the other Sigma 24 to 70 mounted on it right now and it's shooting me with face detect autofocus. So you can see how it performs and what it looks like in this environment. In my previous videos, that camera was using the Tamron 28 to 75. A quick shout out to Camera Canada for lending me the Tamron and the G Master that I used in this comparison. Okay, so let's start with the basics. Build quality, size, weight, and price. The cheapest and smallest of the bunch is the Tamron 28-75. It weighs 577 grams or one and one quarter pounds with the caps on, measures 14 centimeters or 5.5 inches when retracted, and 17 centimeters or 6.5 inches when fully extended, and cost 880 US dollars. The Sigma is noticeably heavier at 852 grams or 1.9 pounds, but it's actually the same height as the Tamron when retracted, but it is about 1.5 centimeters or 5 eighths of an inch thicker across the diameter though. It does get taller than the Tamron when extended, reaching just under 18 centimeters or 7 inches, and it comes in at 1100 US dollars. Lastly, the biggest and most expensive of the bunch is the Sony G Master. It's 922 grams or two pounds and reaches nearly 19 centimeters or 7.5 inches when fully extended. It's also slightly more girthy than even the Sigma and costs a whopping $2,200. Now that extra money does buy you some build quality advantages over the Tamron. The Tamron, despite being a great value, does have a rather cheap feeling in the hand. It's very plasticky, the lens cap is clunky, the focus ring is not nicely dampened, there's no function button or selector switches, and the rings are in the wrong position. Usually I expect my focus ring to be closest to the front, but on the Tamron, the zoom is the thicker ring and it's more forward. Now the G Master has none of these problems obviously, but again, it's much bigger and heavier, so if portability is your number one concern, the Tamron wins. But where it gets interesting is that the Sigma doesn't force you to give up any of the build quality benefits of the G Master, but only costs half as much. It has the function button, the selector switch, and the well dampened rings that are in the right order. And just like the other two lenses, the Sigma is also very well weather sealed. That's something that used to be a weakness of the Sigma art lenses, and it's no longer a concern. Now there are two minor differences in the build between it and the Sony. First off, both have a zoom lock, but they operate differently. The Sony's lock stays on until you click it off, but the Sigma's can be unlocked by forcefully turning the zoom ring. Now this will come down to personal preference. Personally, I prefer the Sigma's implementation because I get the benefits of the lock, but the speed of not having one when I need to zoom in a hurry. The other difference is the direction of the zoom ring. On the Sony, the Tamron, and even the previous Sigma lenses like the 18 to 35 that I'm shooting on right now, you turn the zoom ring clockwise to increase your focal length. But on this new 24 to 70 art, you turn it counterclockwise to get to 70 millimeters. Now this is a bit annoying because it means you can't switch from one of these lenses to the other using muscle memory as they all do something different with their rings. To conclude this section though, the Sigma is the clear winner here unless you really need to save those 275 grams. You get all the benefits of the G Master's build in a slightly smaller form factor for half the price. The only case for the Tamron is again if traveling light is the absolute most important thing. But you should be aware that you're giving up something else on the Tamron to save weight when it comes to that focusing ring. It's non-linear. This means that repeatable focus pulls on video are pretty much impossible on the Tamron, where both the Sigma and the Sony have a linear response. But the Sigma beats the G Master here as well because not only is the focus ring smoother, it also has a much longer throw. I was only getting just over 100 degrees on the Sony, but closer to 360 degrees on the Sigma. So focusing for video is much nicer on the 24 to 70 art. However, this brings us to that strange behavior I mentioned earlier when I was first testing the focus pulls on the Sigma. I noticed the strange jumping that was very visible at the edge of the frame. After trying different focal lengths, apertures, and even camera bodies, I decided to swap out the lens, but the problem persisted. After examining it more closely though, I had a theory that it kind of looked like the image was having its distortion corrected in jumps rather than smoothly through the focus pull. So I tried turning off the distortion correction in the lens compensation menu, and sure enough, the problem disappeared. This suggests to me that we'll need a firmware update on the lens, or maybe even the camera to make this feature work better. This was on the a7 III by the way, but in the meantime, I do not recommend using distortion compensation when shooting video with the Sigma 24-70R. This might not even be a concern for many of you though, as it's off by default in the menu. 
For photos, this isn't an issue, obviously. And if you really need that distortion correction, you can always apply it in post with a more controlled result. So this is definitely a con toward the Sigma as the Sony and Tamron don't have this issue, but I haven't found it to have that much of a practical impact on my images and they'll likely be able to fix it with firmware. Update. I actually received an email from Sigma after reporting this issue to them while I was filming this video, advising me that the head of service at Sigma Japan was able to confirm and reproduce the issue and is now currently investigating a fix. So that's good news. And while we're on the topic of distortion, these lenses all performed pretty equally. The G Master is probably a hair better at 24 millimeters, but it would appear that the Sigma is actually a tad wider than the Sony, so that extra distortion could come down to the extra field of view you get with the Sigma. The Tamron has the least distortion on the wide end, but that's because it doesn't go as wide. And all three of these lenses are mostly distortion free by the time you get to 32 to 35 millimeters. Also, jumping back to the focus pulls, I wanted to see what the focus breathing was like, and I'm pleased to report that it's very well controlled on all of these lenses. If I had to rank them though, the Tamron is clearly the worst, and I'd say the Sigma beat out the G Master by a hair. The Tamron does have an advantage on the G Master though in its close focusing distance. G Master maintains a constant 38 centimeters or 1.25 feet minimum focusing distance regardless of the focal length, but the Tamron has a variable MFD that gets as close as 19 centimeters or 7.5 inches on the wide end for a reproduction ratio of 1 to 3. Surprisingly, this is one area where the Sigma deviates from the G Master and keeps up with the Tamron by also having a variable MFD, but it gets even closer with 18 centimeters or 7 inches at 24 millimeters, allowing it to maintain the Tamron's 1 to 3 reproduction, but with a wider field of view. Something that annoyed me about the Tamron regarding this, however, is the lack of focusing distance info on the lens. Both the G Master and the Sigma clearly indicate their minimum focusing distance rate on the lens, but I had to look it up for the Tamron because it's not written anywhere on the lens that I can see. Also, for those that are curious, the minimum focusing distance is the same for all of these at 70 millimeters, which is the 38 centimeters or 1.25 feet I mentioned earlier. Okay, so let's step away from manual focus and talk about autofocus. First of all, they all focus very, very quickly. We're at a point in time with lenses for Sony where it's almost splitting hairs. If you do portrait photography, products, still life, landscapes, basically anything but the most intense action, you probably won't notice a difference in focusing with any of these lenses. They all do about equally, whether front lit, back lit, stop down, etc. In order to even get a notable and repeatable difference in keeper rate, I had to do rapid push pulls at a focus target shooting on a high burst basically trying to simulate a subject running straight at you. This test is probably irrelevant since I don't think many people buy a standard zoom for sports or birds, but in case you were wondering, here's the keeper rate for fast movement on the a7 III with these lenses. The Sigma 24-70 came in last with a 77% keeper rate, the Tamron came in second with 82%, and the G Master came in first with 88% usable images. Now when it comes to video AF, all three are very, very good. The Sigma was a bit more choppy when I left the frame, where the G Master remained smooth, but all three acquired focus quickly and held it as I approached the camera. I also did a bit of a nightmare test using an extreme backlit shot on S-Log2, and again, all three performed impressively. I did find the responsiveness on the Sigma to be a tad slower than the other two, but the pulls were very smooth. The G Master was the fastest, and the Tamron was a very close second. But the Tamron did struggle here and there. The Sigma, while a tad slower, didn't ever lose track of what it was doing, but the Tamron got stuck a couple times. But the G Master was pretty much flawless. The Sigma did surprisingly pull ahead in my low light face tracking test. Here I would say it performed just as well as the G Master and at times acquired focus sooner. So the Sigma seems to be the best pick for low light shooting. Now moving on to image quality, we're gonna be splitting hairs again because all of these lenses are very sharp. In fact, at 4K resolutions, you'd be hard pressed to even tell the difference. The only way I was able to tell is by the slight temperature variations in their renditions. The G Master was the coolest, the Sigma a bit warmer and greener, and the Tamron was somewhere in the middle. If I was forced to give an analysis though, I'd say the Sigma wins in the center, the Sony wins on the edges, and the Tamron just slightly drags behind in both categories, but not by much at all. Again, barely noticeable unless really punched in. The two cases where there was clearly a winner, however, was in the vignetting and chromatic aberration comparisons. 
The Sigma had the worst vignetting wide open. I made sure to compare these with profile corrections turned off and found the G Master definitely had much better control over the vignette, with again the Tamron riding somewhere in the middle. By the time you get to 35mm though, the playing field starts to level off and it's fairly indistinguishable by 50mm. However, things flipped when it comes to fringing. The Tamron was the worst, but even the G Master showed noticeable fringing in my tests where the Sigma was much cleaner. This disparity evens out a bit when stopped down, but it's worth noting that the Sigma wins here at 2.8 since I'm sure many people will be using this lens wide open. I'm also giving the Sigma the win in the bokeh department. Now this one is obviously subjective, but I found the Sigma to be smoother, rounder, and just overall nicer, which surprises me because I always associated nicer out of focus areas being G Master's thing. But in the 24 to 70 category, I prefer the Sigma. The G Master does still live up to its reputation when it comes to flare resistance though. The Sigma does noticeably better than the Tamron, but not quite as good as the G Master. Okay, I think that's enough comparisons of tiny differences between lenses, because let's face it, this decision is not going to come down to the character of the flare. Instead, I see this being about cost and size. Usually this is where I would say, if you want the absolute best and money isn't an issue, get the G Master. But it's not that easy this time around. While I still think the G Master is the slightly better lens, the margin is much, much smaller than it usually is. So small in fact that it might be a mistake to buy the G Master now that the Sigma exists. I would say that the Sigma 24-70R is 95% the lens the G Master is, and in some ways it's better, like the longer manual focus throw, smoother bokeh, reduced fringing, and shorter close focusing distance. So I wouldn't necessarily go out and sell my G Master to buy the Sigma, but if you're shopping for a standard zoom for your Sony right now, you're getting a terrific value by saving the $1100 and getting damn near the same lens. The only reason I buy the Sony today is if I absolutely needed the best autofocus available and didn't care about the price. But if you're manually pulling focus, you should definitely buy the Sigma instead. So what about the Tamron? Because it's cheaper still at $220 less than the Sigma, but despite that, I would suggest paying the extra money for the Sigma unless size and weight are the most important factors to you. And if that's the case, you're still getting a great lens for a terrific value in the Tamron. I would not recommend it for manually pulling focus in video as it's no good for that, but it does work well in the autofocus department. Optically, it might not quite be up to the standard of the other two lenses, but it does very well for its price. It just doesn't do quite as well as the Sigma does for its price, which is why I'm calling the Sigma 24-70 art for Sony E-mount the best value standard zoom available for that system. And I put my money where my mouth is, it's a lens I'm going to be buying for camera number two. But that's going to be it for me. I hope you found this video entertaining, or at least helpful. And if you did, make sure you leave it the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, well, there's no refunds. All right, I'm done.